This is a Sutotal production. Hello, surveyors. Uh, this is going to act as our first video for Chapter 2, um, practicing some of the content in there. Um, and so we'll just jump right into it. Um, so the first question here says, utilizing the law of definite proportions, what can you conclude about CO2, given that it is composed of 27.3% carbon by mass? All right, so let's look at this. We got law of definite proportions. We've got a molecule specified, and we even have a percent by mass of carbon specified. So all three of these relate together. So CO2 has one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms in it. Um, and we know the percent composition of CO2's carbon percent, so 27.3%. Then it also says we use the law of definite proportion. So what does that mean? That means that we're looking at anytime CO2 comes together, it's always one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms, right? Those atoms have mass, and that's what this percentage is related. So CO2 in and of itself is 100%. Right, and there's only two different atoms in two different elements present, carbon and oxygen. So we can easily figure out the percent composition of oxygen in CO2 because at this point it really is if we know this, all we're left with is oxygen. So if we took a hundred percent and subtracted the twenty seven point three percent, right, because this is carbon, the hundred percent would would be carbon and oxygen. So then we do that subtraction, right, which I'm going to show you. I'm not doing any anything fancy here, all right? So we're just saying 100 minus 27.3. So that gives me 72.7%. I'm going to put that up here. 72.7% of oxygen by mass. Right, and that's all thanks to the law of definite proportions. Right, it tells us that we're always going to see that one to two ratio, that one carbon to two oxygen ratio in CO2, um, and so we're also going to see that this uh, repeating, this idea of repeating, in questions two and three. It says utilizing the law of definite proportions yet again. What what can we conclude about NaClO3? All right, so technically that is uh, sodium chlorate. You'll learn those names soon. So we have sodium chlorate here. It says given its composition, and it gives us a composition of sodium by mass and a composition of chlorine by mass. Well, we know sodium, we know chlorine, so we can figure out oxygen via extension and knowing that it is the law of definite proportions that we're investigating here. So really what we would do is we would say, well, we, we need to take that 100%, subtract out sodium's percentage, 21.6, so, and also subtract out chlorine's percentage, 33.31%, right? And when we do that, what will we get, right? So 100 minus 21.6, also subtract out the 33.31, and that gives us, I'm going to put the arrow up here, that gives us 45.09% remaining unaccounted for. And that would have to be, right, because there's three different elements present, sodium, chlorine, and oxygen. So we know that it has 45.09% oxygen by mass. Right. Okay, uh, next up, the next one, also utilizing the law of definite proportions, what can we conclude about C6H14? So this has two elements in it, carbon and hydrogen. And it tells us you have we have 83.7% carbon by mass. So Right, it's just carbon, it's just hydrogen, so we would be saying 100% minus 83.7%, what does that give us? That would, that would be the hydrogen, right? That's the only thing left over. So 100 minus 83.7, we have 16.3% hydrogen by mass, okay? All right, so that's pretty much the one thing that we can conclude, right? If we're given the percents of all the elements except for one, we just say, all right, well, 100% minus all those given percentages. All right, uh, next up, it looks like four through six are gonna look at a different law. So instead of the law of definite proportions, we're looking at the law of multiple proportions, right? And so in a nutshell, what does the law of multiple proportions tells us? It tells us that different elements can combine in different ratios, right? So 
um, you know, let's look at what we got here. So here we have SO2, and then here we have SOCl2. Right now, here, this is not necessarily following the law of multiple proportions because this one only has sulfur and oxygen, while this one has sulfur and oxygen, but it's got a third uh, element present, chlorine. So the problem is, this isn't really following the law of multiple proportions. If it were, then chlorine, some number of chlorines would have to be over here as well. So that one's not going to work for us. Uh, here we have C2H6, so two carbons, six hydrogens. Here we have C6H6. So what do we see? Carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen. And we see that you have a 2 to 6, you have a 6 to 6. So this is in fact following the law of multiple proportions. Now let's just check the third one to see. Here we've got C, we've got carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen in a certain number, in a certain ratio. So one, two, three. All right, here we have carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So this one doesn't have oxygen and this one doesn't have carbon. So this isn't, since it's got different elements in it, since there's not the same set of elements in all of them, then this isn't really following the law of multiple proportions. All right, number five, it says, which compounds demonstrate the law of multiple proportions? Let's see, here we have N2O2. And here we have N2O4. So it's a 1 to 1 versus a 1 to 2. Um, and it's nitrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, oxygen. This one to me, well, we started out strong. This one is following the law of multiple proportions. All right. Um, but when we look over here, this just has chlorine. And then this one has chlorine and oxygen. So because it's got, because this guy had oxygen and this one didn't, then this isn't following the law of multiple proportions. Uh, and we have the same problem here. We have I3 minus versus IO4 minus. This doesn't have oxygen and this does. So there's no law of multiple proportions to even consider here. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, next up, we have NABR and NACL. Uh, they both have sodium, but they don't both have bromine and they don't both have chlorine. So this isn't following the law of multiple proportions. Here it's got H2O and then CH2O. So they both have hydrogens and oxygens, but they don't both have carbons. So that's not following the law of multiple proportions. Here we've got carbon, uh, not carbon, copper, copper, oxygen, oxygen. And we do see a different number of coppers. So yeah, so this is following the law of multiple proportions. All right, so that's two laws down. Now we have seven, eight, and nine. It says, for seven, there are similar questions. It says, what would an isotope of the following element shown below? What would be an isotope of the following element shown below? All right, so it's specifically talking about silicon. And then we see these numbers, 28 and 14. All right, so when we see this type of um, denotion for an element, um, these numbers pertain to something specific. All right, now, I don't want you to get confused. All right, this is not how it's shown to you on the periodic table. This is something a little different. So let me, let me show you the periodic table real quick. So silicon, all right, let's see, there's silicon right there. All right, so you notice how it has a 14 above, and then it's got this 28 number below. See how they're kind of, they're flipped here? Okay, so be weary of that. All right, um, so on the periodic table, this number above is the atomic number, the number of protons. This number below, it, as a decimal number, this is what we call the weighted average or, or the, the average mass of all silicon atoms in the universe. Um, now, this in particular, you notice the 28 here had a decimal point. The 28 here does not. That's because this is one s specific isotope of silicon. So we consider like all neutrons to have a mass of one, all protons to have a mass of one. And electrons are so small, we don't, we don't consider their mass. So this is what we call them. This would more or less reflect on the mass number, right? So that would be protons plus neutrons. And then this would be the atomic number. So that number is only the number of protons. Okay, so here's the deal. To, to, to be an isotope, it has to be silicon. Now, to be silicon, it also has to have the same number of protons. So this number has to stay the same, this bottom number, 14, the atomic number. 
Now with this silicon, the mass number can change because we can actually see that different isotopes have a different number of neutrons. And so all I have to do is see this number change. So I could have something like 27 here, right? Because that's a different mass number, right? I could even have, say, silicon 29, 14, right? And depending on how crazy it gets, right, I don't know that we would want to see something like this, but, you know, since you don't really know specific isotopes, right, we could go crazy, right? This number could be 40. It could have a mass of 40, meaning in that number 40, this is 14 protons, right? And then the number of neutrons, let's see, what's 40? Uh, I'm not really doing great with math today. So it's 40 minus 14. So that means there's 26 neutrons, right? That's what that 40 means right there. That's crazy, right? So anyway, um, but these are pretty much three um, isotopes of the silicon atom given below right here. Okay, next up it wants us to do another isotope of calcium. All right, and so remember, same, same rules over here apply. This is the atomic number, right? Or AKA the number of protons. This number is the mass number, right? That's the number of protons plus neutrons, right? So if I'm gonna do an isotope of calcium, it has to have the symbol CA and it has to have this number 20 here because it has to have 20 protons to even be calcium. Okay, now from there, this 41 number could change, right? It could be 40, you know, it could be 39, right? It could even be, um, you know, 45. All right, I'm just giving you a whole bunch of scenarios here, right? The, but because this number can change, you get quite a lot of options here, okay? Um, now, I'm not asking for like, what's the real isotope? I'm just asking you to speculate at what you could change here, and that's what I'm trying to show you. All right, and then our last isotope question here, oh, we're using something radioactive. So these guys down here tend to be very radioactive. Europium. All right, so. Um, here, remember yet again, that's the mass number. So that's the number that can change. And then this is the atomic number, AKA the number that cannot change. So we're looking at, you know, something that's always got to have the 63 and the EU, but then this 152 could change, right? It could be 165, right? It could be 142. Right now, the one thing I haven't really talked about is there. There is a certain realm in which these numbers can only go down so low. Right, you cannot get so the so for, for like this guy right here, you cannot get sixty-two. Right, because that's saying the total mass is sixty-two, but it, yet it has sixty-three protons. Right, so that is one limitation. So that's not a keeper. Okay, so. This number up here cannot go below this number, right? And be any way close to possible, right? Because you're, you're, how are you going to have 63 protons, but your mass is less than the mass of 63 protons? That ain't going to happen, bruh. All right. So anyway, with that, um, this kind of concludes our first practice. Um, stay tuned for more Chapter 2 goodness. Adios.